Abby Hosley, who's an activist on campus and a writer on campus, has offered her services to us. We're going to start with her. Let me get the lights in place, and then we'll, we'll have you come on up. Thank you. Um, I've actually never read in public before, so <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, look towards the furthest corner of our flat earth, and you'll find all of humanity carving shapes and spaces into the sand. By some unseen fault, not of our own volition, this resolve to protect the world as we believe to be true is the only thing that endures past the first high tide. Everyone loses everything, or so we've been warned, yet the fruits of our dreams form exquisite landscapes that stand proud and victorious in the face of loss. Call me a fool, I may just be that, but for a moment I'd like to forgo my grievances and extend my hands forward as I trace my own life onto uncertain shores and believe with honest conviction that what I've done was right. And these are just little ditties that I wrote, but they're short. <laughs> um, undressed and selfless, I'd like our limbs to entangle, our ripples to cross, and we can cry for ourselves and each other as we dissolve into a sea of linens and compassion. Too late is but a crutch for the fearful. Before our tongues and teeth become entirely useless, I hope that the beating of our hearts will not always remain unspoken. And that's it. <laughs> well, thank you. So, hi everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Maureen McDonald, and I'm part of the English and Women's Studies faculty here at Eastern. On behalf of the Visiting Writers Series and the Department of English, I'm very pleased to welcome you all here for our reading by Patrick Rosal. I'm a fortunate person for many reasons. Um, one is that the first day I read Pat's work was also the first day I heard Pat read. And I hope that some of you are able to have that experience I enjoyed nearly two summers ago. I was trying in the middle of this midterm filled week to figure out how to characterize Pat's work. Um, one of the poets that Patrick talked about in class today was Walt Whitman, who offers a great place to begin for, for poetry, for us. And Whitman's self-pronouncement that he contained multitudes has sparked good poetry and challenged a lot of poets. But even Whitman might not have dreamt about what happens when a man from Jersey is not inspired only by the trained soprano, but also by making beats and by the quadratic equation. Or what happens when you grow up speaking four languages, hearing four languages inside the walls of your home or what happens when you're fresh from a Fulbright in the Philippines, or what happens when classical, elegiac, painful longing coexists with contemporary swagger. Um, his books give us epic narratives about ambiguous legacies we inherit, as well as precise moments of intimacy. Here's the rust on a car, here's a hot day, here's a human knuckle. His poetry asks us to talk to our own ghosts, and they'll ask you whom you love and how much, the most beautiful intervals are ancient and imperfect. They will teach you to love something so deep, you will want nothing better than to give it all away. Rosal's work asks that we give love in ways that are precise, brave, confrontational, and principled. It insists that we remember things that we haven't been told, but somehow have always known. Um, this multiplicity of media, of genre, of disciplines, of sounds of language, of experience, all of these things that we see and Patrick Rosal's work asks that we redraw our boundaries. Um, there's a number of awards that this man has won. Um, he has two volumes of poetry that are currently out. The first is Upspin, Headspin, Scramble, and Dive, which was the winner of the 2003 Member's Choice Award from the Asian American Writers Workshop. His most recent publication, My American Kundaman, 
uh, established him as a poet of extraordinary creativity, breadth, and force, and also earned him distinction um, as the winner of the 2007 Global Filipino Literary Award, as the finalist for the 2007 Member's Choice Award by, from the Asian Americans Writers Workshop, and as winner of the 2006 Book Award in Poetry from the Association of Asian American Studies. Um, and I found out, um, luckily, at lunch today that he also has an upcoming book called Shepherd Mom. Bone Shepherd that'll be coming out next fall. We are so lucky to have Patrick with us tonight. I want to thank the Visiting Writer Series and the Department of English, and I also want to acknowledge the time and talents of Miranda Lau, who helped orchestrate this visit. So please join me in welcoming Patrick Rosal. Wow, that was, um, that was an amazing introduction. Thank you so much, Maureen. The whole day has been, um, it's been so rich. Uh, I met with many of you I've, um, I met during the course of the day, but clearly this is a, this is a really special place with, with special students and, and special teachers who are, who are thinking about um, the world in, in such challenging and interesting ways. I'm, I'm really honored to be a, uh, to be welcomed here. Um, I want to thank Abby, too. Just um, two gorgeous poems. And for you to come up here, you know, it takes a lot of bravery to do that. And you, you knocked it out. So thank you. Um, and, and the first line of your poem about, about reaching towards, towards the margins, I feel like in some ways that's something that we were talking about in a couple of the classes today, is how poetry can reorient what we what we look at, what we what we pay attention to, that it's not always towards the center, but um, but towards the margins too, and th and that you said something about um, scrolling down, scrolling things about your uncertain life, like in the face of that uncertainty, and sometimes some ways out of that uncertainty, that's where um, that's where poems come from. Just gorgeous work. Uh, thank you so much for sharing, and thank you all for uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I have no idea why I'm so nervous right now. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm, really, I'm really very honored to be here. I, um, there's been so much hype about all the awards and stuff like that. I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with them. Um, I'm going to start off with a sort of an ode. I'm sorry. Maybe not a subject that, that you would expect for an ode. Poem for my extra nipple. I really got a third one. It's true. Burnt out sun, shut eye, stillborn amoeba, minuscule miscarriage of the flesh, ant head, desiccated heart. A volcano's embryo, unborn twin budged through my breast, misplaced knuckle. I let my woman kiss me here. This brown pearl of a Longapo bay, thorn pierced inch deep into dermis, milkless gland. The aria's last note lost between armpit and sternum, it is a secret passage to the aortic contortions behind my ribs, swollen sand grain from the beach where I watched my brother nearly drown. I pray to it, this singed hint of some great, great grandfather's sin come back. I am going to read a, um, a bunch of poems from um, from the new book, Bone Shepherds, if that's cool. Um, so I am, uh, I am currently madly in love. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you don't have to clap. You can clap that she loves me back. That's something. <laughs> that's news. Um, and in sort of, I guess the wooing stage of this of this whole thing. Um, I'm talking to a buddy of mine, Roger, and I'm saying, well, you know, I don't know what to do, man. He's like, well, you got to write a poem. 
I said, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what to write about. Melissa and I had, we've known each other for a number of years. And at that moment, Melissa sent me a text and he looked over my shoulder and saw the, saw the message from her, but more importantly saw her name. And he said, Melissa Piano? Her last name is Piano? You gotta write that poem, dog. <laughs> so this is the poem. <clears throat> I, I'm also, um, I also for a long time wanted to become a jazz pianist. The Tradition of Pianos, for Melissa Piano. I've played spinets, toys, consoles, and uprights, banged through ballads, blues, and pop on a Bosendorfer, even jammed in A minor one night on a concert grand with Max Roach sitting next to me, comping his spare stock forth voicings behind my blundering solos, I know. Some pianos are beautiful by themselves, in the corner of a room with big light and a chandelier above, but an instrument like that is meant to draw you in. It's very silence and invitation. It's strings bare, did you know this? 20 tons of force to keep them taut, and it takes just one meager human body bent to the keys to shake a whole goddamn concert hall with, I'll say it, Love. The swelled tonnage of air become brisk with it. Old beat up players too with their stinky scrolls and sticky ivories yellowed. I like to touch them, to hear the honky tonk shrill like a voice famished into nothing but a thirst for a shot of rum from a scrap steel cup. And I don't mean to suggest one must suffer in order to make great art. Only that we all, at one time or another, suffer terribly anyway. So we have music. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> My sweet girl, I wanted to write a poem about you, and all I could think of was your name. All the stories asleep inside it, the way a piano holds so many notes, each note itself a choir, silent until the choir's touched. And my God, how whole crowds move when they move. I've seen it, grand ballrooms bounding and body rock basements crowded with couples sweating, muzzle to muzzle to some playful martillo rhythm swing. It happens. Remember when the Chelsea docks swayed beneath us dancing and you clapped so hard and so long you broke your watch and woke with wrists bruised. We laughed at that. This this, this is what music can do, can let all the love out of us fearlessly, and we can boogie down or kiss. I mean, how many behemoths of loneliness have been tamed with how little music? You don't know this, but... At the Blue Note, the night Amel LaRue's daughter, Skye, climbed onto that eight-foot Steinway and seemed to call up from the total heft of that one piano, that box full of hammers, every flawed song, every simple glee, the reckoned sum of electricity humming from a whole bloodline's as yet unnamed rage, one slender child, descendant of jubilance and rapture, not the stuff of myth or wish alone, but toil too, since Nothing with such majestic proportions of silence is forged without curses, slog, and sweat. I watched your face as you became right then and there a young girl again. And I didn't say a word. Think, Melissa, of all the secrets between us. And think of all the clandestine joys in the wood of one piano. Consider the men who chop its spruce and maple down. Think of whom those men must sometimes fail to love with all their might when they go home battered and tired. Think also of the truckers who haul the wood for miles by rig to those quirky piano makers who conjure math and the devils of pig iron to engineer some beast-scaled hunk, some apparatus that played with both precision Precision and weight falls only infinitesimally short of holy. And think of all the unsaid bliss inside of you and me, stored up for so many generations before us. All those distant, strange folk with our same hands, cuddling in the dark, hiding from each other's promises of adoration. Go on, close your eyes, but trust. I met a 15-year-old at a jam session who says, he practices all his changes blindfolded. 
Art Tatum sought out pianos mostly out of tune or whose keys didn't all work to test what good sound he could coax from their partial ruin. What does it mean that Lenny Tristano, son of Italian immigrants, invented a style whose chords are lush harmonic clusters, the wrists moving in close parallel motion up and down the keyboard? Who called that style locked hands? So Shearing stole it and Milt Buckner and Oscar Peterson perfected it. I've known you these five years and it seems I've been listening to the history of pianos now my whole life. Bobby Timmons, Phineas Newborn Jr., Monk. There must be more to all such proper nouns bequeathed from parent to child. These are my heroes. Miles, for example, talked shit about McCoy. But the summer of 1988, on the bedroom floor, I rigged a turntable straight with no preamp and knelt to the speaker with my favorite things playing over and over. And I'd pop up to run between between that hot, cramped wreck of a space and the brown Baldwin, Baldwin in the living room until I finally doubled over on the stairs and surrendered. I would never play like that. If a piano can make a part-time petty thug weep, what will it do to a full-grown man with no better sense than to profess his affections to a woman who reminds him of all the gorgeous music that has filled him up for good? And when he remembers, he can walk into some of the darkest corners of the world without dread or braggadocio because he knows he's been cared for by good and imperfect people. He need not tremble in the face of small dangers. He, I, only need to stare into the terrifying dark because there's a machine in the world upon which I've placed my fingers countless times, a contraption whose bulk is like God's one good fist, which sometimes opens to reveal four centuries worth of solitude. If one day you and I should call each other love, and you wake to find me in the next room, leaned into the piano as though looking into a deep living pond, don't be scared to sit quietly beside me. I'm just listening as now for the thousand instances of touch lost in all the years of your name. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Big old poem. couple of short poems. Another ode to my left hand. I'm a righty. <laughs> ode to my left hand. Swan neck deformity of the middle digit bent. Pinky crook at the bottom knuckle. You last and first shot of my best three punch combo. Sinister wrist, clumsy brother nearer to my heart, worse half of two failed wings, graceless one. I know I am no less human without you. I praise then not so much what you are, but you, what you, I, long to touch. You starfish stranded at the farthest precinct of this body, bird flipped in the faces of punks and priests. You who flung me over barbed fences, thank you for your good memory of flame and clits, peaches open to their pits, your petty thief's grip. Thank you for all things I could name, but which you could not possibly reach, for all that scorched, calloused, and bruised you, for everything we let go. Little men, it's basketball season. Syracuse lost. To Georgetown, did you know that? Okay, so maybe this, man, I was gonna read a couple of basketball poems. I guess <laughs> this might not be the crowd. Little men with quick hands. I was always the smallest dude on the court. This is a poem about basketball, but you'll see, kind of, it makes a makes a detour into into history. Little men with quick hands. The sweat flicks from your elbows when you deliver the sweet no look to the big man on the wing. You've been running whole crews since noon. It's a hard country, 90 feet long and 50 feet wide, and everyone on the borders 
wants in, though no one belongs for more than 48 minutes at a time. You know most all the players' names because some you named yourself. You know in a half-court set how to pick a crossover from a point guard's hip and when to talk shit to the seven-footer who last week dunked on you hard. They know you'll chase down the lead man on a fast break and eat gravel just to make sure the young gun with the swift first step is the only one not smiling when the two of you next time square off. You know how to box out a stocky forward on the inside with a slick hip pull so the ref can't see you are a little man with fast hands. Come from a long line of stealth and flash like the Filipino scout who scaled solo the sheer face of a mountain with nothing but a bolo blade in his teeth to reach a small squad of slumbering Japanese soldiers in a cave camped out. The scout slit the necks of 14 without waking them. He let the 15th sleep. This is just ball, but you know what's up. Our hands are quick. The history is deep. Making love to you the night they take your father to prison. There's got to be a chorus somewhere for the conjunction of honeysuckle and funk. A verse for the turn of your hips and the sling back steel bar anthem banged out breathless over your father's small time underhand hustle. A tune that begins in the skin's high hat quiver, begins with the lick of the fist or the thrum of a summer gust doubled in the brief sweet moan coaxed from your mouth and mine. We grind. Slow, two bodies become one small song, scarcely loud enough to budge God and any three of his bloody saints. Baby, we are our own wine. We improvise the gorgeous toil, stillness, and motion against each other make. Bone on blunt bone, gleefully barbaric, call it blessed. We call something like salt out of the seep of evening air, immense and rising. Like incense so stink, hellfire must work twice as hard to burn it into us than once again back out. By dawn, you'll leave my finger between your teeth and behind it, the last grief of the first man you've ever adored on the verge of free. Sometimes the body in music unlocks its most ruthless interrogatives and to this and the rest of the world tonight I cannot stop saying yes. Guitar. I have a friend Sheila who wanted to who wanted to learn uh, guitar so I uh, I gave an old one to her as a gift. The bottom end is a little shallow, and you might need to shim the bridge to hush the fifth fret buzz. The action's low and the neck a tad warped, but I swear this thing sings. For 10 years, I've accompanied lovers, convicts, and children with this guitar. Bought it with my last hundred bucks, 50 more perhaps than it was even worth that day. I just wanted to touch nylon again, to play the way my Uncle Ellie used to, till cancer mugged him for his lungs. He sang, Sheila, and the guitar did too. And that kind of singing was like 11 acres of sky to a nine-year-old kid terrified of a 50-mile-per-hour hardball. The summer my father came back from burying his mother in the Philippines, he told my brother and me the two oblong boxes he pulled off the luggage conveyor were ours. Once home, we pried the cardboard apart, tearing the packing tape and snapping the industrial staples loose with our bare hands. I ran my fingers slow around the slick sound hole edge. I stuck my nose into the strings to smell the jackfruit wood stewing inside. And when I pulled my face away, the instrument made its first silken hum. I don't know if you believe in time the way I do, but when history touches us, it's like hearing a skinny uncle sing with a cigarette dangling from his lips without one note of misery in his dying, and the guitar he's holding is yours. You might not understand the words sailing past you, but one day, years later, on a drive back to Rockland maybe, where an old woman scolded you as a child or kissed the small bones of your shoulders, you may find yourself singing out of nowhere that tune. I mean to say, I never thanked my father for that first guitar. I smashed it in a tantrum against my heel and didn't own another until this one. I should warn you, every guitar has its ghosts, and they'll ask you, whom you love and how much. As for learning, your hands are gonna ache a little while, 
But one day, when the chords come easy, the guitar will whisper to you some old secret. Whisper back. The most beautiful intervals are ancient and imperfect. They will teach you to love something so deep, you will want nothing better than to give it all away. Thank you. I'm gonna read a couple of poems from my American Kundiman also. So um, some of you know that my father is, a, is an ex-Catholic priest. Um, and uh, he, was, uh, he was ordained on March 17th. So that's how I got my name. I was, I was named after the day that my dad promised never to have sex. <clears throat> and then he had sex <laughs> at least three times since there's, I got two brothers. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was more. This is about my name. St. Patrick. After the man they say chased the snakes out of Ireland, after the patron of the day my father was ordained into the church, he wanted me baptized with the word click shut like a trap. My name starts with a brittle snap, a kiln dried wood, and ends with a trick. It claims my skin, my flat nose, thick lips, the 11 ways I've kissed one woman to sleep. When I die, I want my friends to christen me again, dab my head with oil, bless my lips with rum. I want them to give me a name they'll tag in alleys, chisel into rock, cracked in its side. A name as far from heaven as the next George Street bar. I want a name like a Luther Vandross slow jam, like a Kundiman, like a New Orleans double time march. Something they can pour on the floor, stomp on with the shoes, grinding it to dust. I want them to dance till their God forsaken feet turn blue. I had a, uh, all right. About the white boys who drove by a second time to throw a bucket of water on me. <clears throat> the first time, they merely spat on me and drove off. I stood there a while, staring down the road after them as if I were looking for myself. I even shouted my own name. But when they cruise past again to toss a full bucket of water and who knows what else on me, I charged, sopping wet after their car. And though they were quickly gone, I kept running. Maybe it was hot that August afternoon, but I ran the whole length of Main Street, past the Five and Dime where I stole Spaldines and Rabbit's Feet, past the Rara Inn Bus Depot and Bo's Den and the projects where Derek and them scared the shit out of that girl. I pumped the thin pistons of my legs all the way home. Let's get real. It's been 25 years and I haven't stopped chasing them. Through all those side streets in Metuchen, each pickup b-ball game, every swanky midtown bar, I've looked for them in every white voice that slurred and cursed me with an earshot, in every pink and pretty body whose lights I wanted to punch out and did. To be honest, I looked for them in every set of thin lips I schemed to kiss, and this is how my impossible fury rose like stone in water. I ran all seven miles home that day, and I've been running ever since, arriving finally here. And God damn it, I'm gonna set things straight. The moment they drove by laughing at a slant-eyed yellow-backed goop, they must have seen a boy who would never become a man. We could say they were dead wrong, but instead, let's say this. Their fathers gave them their rage, as my father gave me mine. And from that summer day on, we managed to save her every bloody thing that belonged to us. It was a meal constantly replenished, a rich bitterness we've learned to live on for so long, we forget how, like brothers, we put the first bite in one another's mouths. I'm gonna read, how am I doing on time, you okay? Give me two or three more. And then, I don't know if you all have questions. I know, I know we've had a lot of talking today, but I'd be happy to open it up. This is from my cousin who's in the, 
who's in the Marines now. He did, a, he did one tour in Iraq. He's, he's in Okinawa. I'm going to see him, actually, for the first time in years um, next week. But prior to, to going into the service, um, basically, you know, he comes from a working class family. His folks gave him two, choice, two choices. Either he goes gets locked up because he was getting in so much trouble or go into the service. Um, and he kind of kind of lost his mind a little bit um, before that. On behalf of my teenage nephew, a humble supplication to sadness. When this six foot beautiful hooligan is drugged, cuffed, and dragged back to the center for living, a 10 room hospital ward with three steel doors locked both ways, it will keep him a few days from his cramped quarters at home where he stalks back and forth in some imagined cage, threatening to bash his daddy's head open with a bat. I want to know what useless art will save him now. I once heard, in order to have happiness, you must pay your debt to sorrow. Well, even if it's true, the heart's got such bullshit bureaucracies such careful accounts of this and that. Do not exact right away the full rotten fine. Let him wail all night, all day, and through another yet again. From the fulcrum of his hips, let him rock his every petty misery with his handsome body you might mistake for laughter scabbard. Let it be the sweetest keen a thug can cut into the air from lip to crotch. Let him sob. Let him shell out every hour of 19 years and then some. I mean, yes, let him square his mother's lean as well. I mean, appraise it in his sopping sleeves and knees. Dear anguish, my spoiled chum, I'm asking you to bear away two lifetimes worth what he owes. But don't truck all at once, you greedy bastard, the whole stinking do. Let him learn to carve slowly into his lap with a weeping the heat and weight of molten silver, the names of those he can barely stand to love. And let every letter burn across his belly. Then call your accruals nil. Cull from his old age your skimpy tariffs. So this exuberant bully and I will have a chance or two to earn from one another the proper wages of men. So we might scrawl our corrected ledgers into the margins without aching for some familiar sorrow to set us and our fathers free. I'm just going to read one more. Then we can call it a night. I know it's midterm time. <clears throat> but I would like to hear from you all. So, oh shit, I thought I was here just to listen. No. <laughs> Let me hear you say la. la. I know it's midterm, but you can give me a little more than that, right? <laughs> Let me hear you say la. la. Let me hear you say la. trenches because you figure in the dreams of people who do not even know you. Because you are beautiful, all of you sing. Because you have sons who might learn to honor wind the way you praise the sound of mouths at your breast. Because you love the smell that rises from your own blood between your legs. Because you love women, beautiful women, all of you sing. Because you royal sand and tide and eyes. Because cities throb with your bodies. Because you burn, drink fire, belong to no one. Sing, beautiful women, all of you. Because you give a thousand hours of short nights to touch you. Because you touch, I only hope to meet you slowly, one by one, in the sweet blackberry rawness of your la la la. Thank you.